Great, everyone. Uh, I think we can get started now. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Jackie Seisman, and I am the Assistant Director of Baby's First Test. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We will be discussing critical congenital heart disease, or CCHD, which is very relevant since February is Heart Month. Before we really jump into today's presentation, I want to discuss a few webinar logistics. This webinar is being recorded, and a link will be available online on the Baby's First Test YouTube channel within 48 hours. We will also be hosting a public square on CCHD, um, and in reference to today's presentation on babiesfirsttest.org. Um, the Newborn Screening Public Square was created in September and is an open space really dedicated to conversations around newborn screening. It's designed to share ideas, knowledge, and bring together a range of communities um, and experiences within newborn screening to help improve both education and awareness. Um, and a link will be provided to you after the webinar so you can join in and participate. Finally, if you have any questions, please ask um, questions using your question box on the right-hand side of your screen in the control panel at any time during the presentation. We will be collecting those questions during the presentation and answering them at the end. If you do need any IT or technical assistance, well, please use the chat box to communicate. The agenda for today, we'll be giving a quick introduction to baby's first test. And then we'll have two great presenters, um, Lisa Hamwadler from Children's National Heart Institute, who will discuss the evolving science and policies around CCHD since it was added to the recommended uniform screening panel in 2011. Um, Lisa will also discuss their activities for both healthcare providers and families. Finally, we have Erin Palmer, who is a member of the 2016 Consumer Task Force on Newborn Screening. She will share her family's experience with CCHD and her current project as a Consumer Task Force member. And the Consumer Task Force on Newborn Screening is a program of Babies First Test, and it was really created to engage relevant stakeholders with an interest in newborn screening. Members of this task force will be trained on issues relevant to newborn screening, and they also create projects targeting groups that are maybe typically unaware or underinformed about the importance of newborn screening and newborn screening itself. Um, and you can visit, if you want to learn more about the Consumer Task Force program, you can also visit babiesfirsttest.org to learn more. And then we also should have about 10 minutes or so or more to answer questions. So I'll first begin, um, and I will start today with a background on an introduction just to the newborn screening clearinghouse for those that may be best familiar with our program. So we are the newborn screening clearinghouse, um, and we, our main goal is to increase newborn screening awareness and education through engagement. This was created in response to the Newborn Screening Save Lives Act of 2008. We were reauthorized in 2014. And we are essentially a one-stop shop for newborn screening information and education for a range of stakeholders, for healthcare providers, parents and family members, new and expecting parents, policymakers, industry, and of course, the public. And this was really created based on consumer-focused newborn screening projects. We, um, as you may have known, uh, Babies First Test houses this nation's newborn screening clearinghouse. And as a clearinghouse, Babies First, Ray Babies First Test connects parents and healthcare providers with extensive information and resources on Babies First Test at the local, state, and national levels. Um, and we do this in a variety of ways, from sharing, you know, what your state offers. Every state screens for different conditions. We have information in all 50 states. Um, we also share information on all 77 newborn screening conditions. We have other, not just the website, but we have programs such as our Consumer Task Force and our Challenge Awards. We also just launched a mobile app. We have an iOS version and an Android version of Baby's First Test, so you can search for state and condition information. It also saves your searches. And we also launched a few new features this year, including a resource center where you can states and organizations can add their resources, but you can also order Babies First Test resources online for free. You can download them and you can share them with your audience or stakeholders. And then finally, we have the Newborn Screening Public Square, which I just mentioned earlier. These are just some of the new features that have been around for the last couple months. 
But really looking at the numbers of who comes to baby's first test, and um, as I mentioned before, we've, for consumer advocates, we've trained 37 since 2012, um, and from across 18 states. For babiesfirsttest.org, we've had over 1.8 million visitors with over 2 million sessions and over 3.6 million page views. And since 2014, we've seen a 100,000 increase in visits and really showing about 60,000 sessions per month, and that's steadily increasing. So we have all these numbers, but who's really coming to visit Babies First Test? Of that 1.8 million visitors, we conducted a user satisfaction survey in 2016, and we really found that 47% are identified as healthcare professionals, and 7% identify as advocates, and 46% identify as family members of the newborn. And of that 46%, 19 of a parent with a new baby on the way, and 18 um, with a new baby. So that's just a small snapshot of who's coming to Baby's First Test. Of course, if you're interested in learning more, you can always email me. My contact information will be at the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to kick it off um, for Lisa Holmwadler from the Children's National Heart Institute. So I will be changing um, five changing presenters. Thanks, Jackie. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, Lisa. Perfect. I think we're just working on changing presenters, and you should be showing your slides shortly. Great. So I think we're viewing your 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 screen. All right. Are you able to see my slides, Jackie? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, Babies First Test, very much for this opportunity to present on today's webinar. I'm very excited to be speaking with all of you. Um, I am a nurse at Children's National Heart Institute. We're located in Washington, D.C., and I also have the privilege of being a co-chair of the New Steps Critical Congenital Heart Disease Technical Advisory Work Group, along with Amy Goviglio, who's in the Department of Health in Minnesota. Um, so Children's National is located, as I said, in Washington, D.C. We were originally started as um, a place for orphans after the Civil War. This is our original building, and now we look very different, um, something out of Star Wars. Um, but heart surgery has changed quite a bit since then as well. Children's National does about 500 surgeries, um, heart surgeries alone, on pediatric patients. Um, and just to put that in perspective, these surgeries are being done on um, infants whose hearts are often the size of, if you think about your heart being about the same size as your fist, um, infant fists are fairly small and they're probably about the size of a walnut. So our surgeons are doing um, about 500 surgeries a year on, on um, infant hearts the size of a walnut, which really, I think, makes an impression on me when I think about how far we've come. Um, because back in 1870, if a child was born with uh, critical congenital heart disease, um, it certainly was a death sentence without access to anesthesia and cardiovascular surgery. So we've definitely come a long way. Um, and then Babies First Test wanted me to speak today about some of the research and uh, actions on education and implementation since critical congenital heart disease screening was added to the recommended uniform screening panel by the secretary uh, Sibelius in 2011. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with pulse oximetry screening, it is a harmless, uh, a painless test. It's non-invasive. It's basically attaching a light emitter to the infant's hand and foot. Um, so those are the pre- and post-ductal oxygen saturation readings. Um, and for many of you, you probably, if you've been to the doctor or to the emergency room, I hope not, but it's the red light that they put on your finger. That's the adult version. The sensors that we use are specifically uh, for children and infants, but that's what pulse oximetry is. And what it's doing is measuring the oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin in the arterial blood. What we've known and the reason why it's so important to identify these 
congenital heart defects early prior to when infants are being discharged from the hospital is because late diagnosis is associated with higher mortality. And while we've known that for a while, um, there was a very nice study that came out in 2015 showing um, survival probability and how it's improved with early detection in the pre- and antenatal period. So what exactly are we looking for? There's a lot of different variation when we talk about critical congenital heart defects. Um, usually people are referring to those heart defects that infants are born with and require life-saving intervention either through surgery or through cardiac catheterization within the first month or some say year of life. So these babies um, need intervention in order to survive. So the first seven primary targets that we were looking for that were identified by the um, Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders were these seven primary targets. Um, about two years ago, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Academy of Pediatrics partnered, and they put together an expert panel to look at whether or not other target lesions should be included. Um, so actually, they last year came out with this table. Um, it was published in this very nice paper written by Matt Oster as well as several others, um, including Children's National Dr. Martin, who's done a lot of advocacy work over the past 10 years. Um, so I really recommend this paper that came out last year that contained the lessons learned from newborn screening for congenital heart defects. And it really did just that and look at um, expanding that list from the original seven as well as emphasizing the importance of secondary conditions. What we're seeing um, and what we're calling secondary conditions are those conditions that are not critical congenital heart defects, but are other things that can cause low oxygen saturation in the blood, including um, sepsis, respiratory illnesses, and some um, hemoglobinopathies, as well as non-critical heart uh, defects. So taking a look at implementation since 2011, we've accomplished a lot and a lot of that was due to a very nice coming together by individual investigators, so researchers, professional organizations such as the March of Dimes, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Cardiology College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, um, wonderful parent advocates and uh, advocacy groups. Uh, state agencies and federal government as well as industry. Uh, so way back in 2011 when it was added to the RUSC, there were three states, Indiana, Maryland, and New Jersey, who were looking at implementing CCHD screening. Uh, the following year, as of June of 2012, you can see there's uh, quite a bit of gray still in the United States map when you look at who's screening for critical congenital heart defects. But you do see a lot of action in the states, including legislation introduced and uh, multi-center screening projects. Um, this is our current map right now. Um, Wyoming is the most recent state. I think they are looking at final regs right now. Um, and so if you look at this, we have two states that don't have a requirement to screen for CCHD as of right now, and those are Idaho and Kansas. We'll talk a little bit more about Kansas in a couple slides. I did want to highlight New Jersey, which was one of the first states to implement. Um, they had the amazing experience where um, a baby was identified using pulse oximetry screening that would have been discharged on the very first day they started screening, and that's what this picture is. I think Governor Christie came and visited that family. Um, and they did publish their first three years of outcomes um, in pediatrics in 2013. Um, they screened 99.6%, so they did an excellent job with implementing. Um, and they identified 13 babies who would otherwise have been discharged from the hospital. And New Jersey is one of uh, at least two states. Most states do follow the nationally recommended um, AAP protocol. But theirs is a little bit more uh, stringent where they're willing to accept a slightly higher number of false positives. And we'll talk a lot more about uh, false positives and sensitivity when we go to the international section of my presentation. But um, basically, they were able to identify a couple more babies that would not have failed the um, AAP protocol. Um, I wanted to highlight DC. Uh, we were able to have it become law in 2015. Uh, we added it through the Healthy Hearts of Babies Act. And what was really wonderful about that is what you see here is pictured as many children who have 
um, had the surgery as infants who have congenital heart defects who came with their families to testify um, before the D.C. Council in 2015 in favor of the new law. And I did want to highlight Michelle Coleman and Dylan. Um, Children's National conducted a feasibility study in 2010, and so he was about four, I guess, three or four years old. Um, and he and his mom came, and they they actually lived in the District of Columbia when he was born. And had he been born in a D.C. hospital, he would not have been identified before going home and would have been discharged with his defect and not received the surgery that he needed. So that's kind of a nice story. She chose to deliver in Maryland at the hospital where we were conducting a pilot study. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about Vermont and Kansas, their unique states, because um, their public health departments were very involved and pushed out a lot of education, and they were able to implement programs in all of the hospitals in their state prior to having a state requirement to screen. So why is it so important to have public health involved? One of those reasons is um, because of data and being able to have surveillance as to the effectiveness of pulse oximetry screening once implemented, as well as to link uh, babies to make sure that they're uh, getting into the state public health programs that they may need. Um, so in 2013, a third stakeholders group came out of, made up of experts, including families um, and folks from all over the country, and they published a recommended minimum data set and considerations both for birth facilities, so that's at the hospital level, as well as at the public health level. Um, one of the key lessons learned since 2011 is the importance of data and being able to use that data to improve, not only to improve to make sure that every baby is being screened, but also to make sure that the protocol is being adhered to correctly. And so this data set right here is from a project that Children's National worked on in 2013, where, as you can see, um, the numbers circled in red, 195, that actually should have been a retest because there's a difference between the pre- and post-ductal oxygen saturation of four or more. So this baby was incorrectly passed. It should have been a rescreen. And so part of um, what we've been working on since 2011 is making sure that there's feedback loops to the screeners and to hospitals, um, making sure that the protocol is being interpreted correctly and that babies are being re-screened and not passed incorrectly. And another key, um, if you look at in red, we were looking at whether or not babies are being screened early because screen, being screened early may have a higher false positive rate. Um, so we wanted to make sure they were being screened at or around 24 hours of age. Um, while we certainly had a lot of successes with implementation and education in the past five years, um, certainly there are things to expand upon and remaining challenges. Um, that includes population level outcomes tracking at the national level, improving short and long-term follow-up, um, analyzing the data. Um, so not every state is collecting data or able to collect data. And so um, without that robust data set, it's difficult to inform whether or not um, we can change the algorithm. And I know the CDC and Matt Osser, they put out a paper about two years ago looking at whether or not we had enough data to change the nationally recommended algorithm. And so far, um, I think the consensus was that we don't quite have enough data to change the algorithm yet. So there have been no changes since 2011 to the recommendation um, in the US. Uh, certainly, special populations we're still looking at. We'll talk a little bit about altitude um, in NICUs and home births. And as well as the importance of reaching underserved populations and continuing to educate pediatricians and obstetricians on the latest research and best practices around screening. Uh, one thing that really addresses that uh, was the is what was put together is the New Steps Technical Assistance. And that was originally made possible through HRSA grant. Uh, we've been able to continue that for five or six years. And we have quarterly webinars um, that are all recorded and transcribed and available online. And those are welcome for anyone to listen in. Um, you can see some of the topics have recently been around data collection, out of hospital births, and using data to improve. Um, there's also been a national data repository to assist with um, surveillance and being able to make sure that we can evaluate outcomes in terms of uh, the success of screening programs and making sure that infants are being linked to programs um, for, for those 
with um, congenital heart defects. So if you have any questions about that, please feel free to email uh, the New Steps group or myself. We'd be happy to talk more about that. Another resource that's been helpful with implementation and education is uh, Toolkit. So Children's National Develops a Toolkit. It's been sent out, um, I think we're probably about four or 5,000 different institutions have requested it. And what it contains is education for families, competency for providers as well as uh, recommendations for how to implement at your hospital. Um, Children's National also had the good fortune to receive two challenge awards and partner with Babies First Tests on creating uh, video, educational videos for providers and families. We've been able to translate those uh, parent videos into five additional languages to try to reach underserved communities. And all of these uh, resources are, of course, available free of charge. Um, so one continuing challenge is that of screening at high and moderate altitudes. Uh, so if you're screening at high or moderate altitudes, what you'll see is a higher false positive rate. So more babies will fail but not have critical congenital heart disease is what that means. So at sea level, you have approximately a 0.2% failure rate. Um, if you're screening at moderate altitude, um, that goes up to 1.1%. So it's a higher number of false positives. And this is due to delayed transition, um, pulmonary vasodilation, as well as a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So Colorado is one state that's had to deal with um, screening at altitude and what the Colorado legislature did after hearing testimony from the Colorado School of Public Health was in 2015 um, they went ahead and implemented CCHG screening for all birthing facilities uh, and required screening be conducted at those facilities that are below 7,000 feet of elevation and we continue to look there's no um, recommendation for screening at high elevations yet. However, researchers have looked at different things such as um, giving babies oxygen prior to the screen or delaying the screening a little bit. But as of right now, um, they're screening babies below 7,000 feet, at least in Colorado. Um, another area where we're looking at developing recommendations and best practice is that of home birth. Um, and one country that's really led the way with this topic is the Netherlands. They have a much higher percent of home births in the Netherlands. I think um, up to about 30 percent of their deliveries are midwife attended home births, whereas in the U.S. it's uh, many states are 1 percent or less um, see home births. Um, and so they developed and published an algorithm where they're looking at um, screening prior to when the midwife leaves as well as um, on day one of life. And I think in the U.S., at least in Wisconsin, they're using the AAP protocol, which is at 24 hours of age, so they're screening those babies when the midwife comes back to reassess the baby on day one of life. Um, one limitation of screening, which we've known about since uh, recommending it be, be conducted at the national level, is that of false negatives. So false negatives are those babies that have a critical heart defect but are not identified as needing further assessment through pulse oximetry screening. Um, what we know is that if we combine pulse oximetry screening with newborn assessment and prenatal ultrasound, detection rates are greater than 90%. However, if we just look at the sensitivity of pulse oximetry screening alone, uh, meta-analysis of primary studies shows that sensitivity is right around 76%. So there's still a significant number of babies that can be missed um, when just using pulse oximetry screening. A lot of those misses, um, and this is from the original Grinelli paper that came out in 2009, um, are the left-sided outflow tract obstruction, such as coarctation of the aorta and interrupted aortic arch. And so about 40% of the misses, and this continues to be true, um, based on data sets that have come in after 2011 is that a lot of those misses, about half of them, are still those left-sided outflow tract. Um, so aside from false negatives, we definitely want to continue to make sure uh, we've done a lot of work educating clinical providers and nurses and newborn nurseries on proper screening techniques, and this is from our um, toolkit, as well as choosing the best locations for testing. And so on the newborn, it's the 
thumb or the great toe or as well as the outer aspect of the hand or foot. Um, and certainly we want to educate parents to uh, still be on the lookout for signs and symptoms of critical congenital heart disease even if the baby passes their pulse ox screening. Um, and one of the big ones is the difficulty uh, feeding which of course a lot of babies have. So some of the symptoms of critical congenital heart disease are sort of subtle in terms of um, being able to identify, but um, certainly we can't rule out a heart defect. Uh, it is a screening technique only and identifies which infants need a closer look and assessment. I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about what's going on internationally, both in terms of implementation and what some of the discussion has been given new research that's come out. So first we'll talk about the protocols for critical congenital heart disease screening. And here I have listed um, protocols from several different countries, just illustrating the timing as to whether or not uh, the screening is being done before or after 24 hours of age, as well as whether or not the protocol requires both the hand and foot um, pulse oximetry readings. So as you can see, um, several of them, most of them are at or above 24 hours of age, with the UK and Polish models being less than 24 hours of age, and most of them also look at um, the pre- and post ductal saturations, and I'll talk about why in a couple of minutes. So what are we looking for when we're analyzing or comparing screening tests? Um, and so this table here is a nice illustration of uh, where we are with CCHG screening and what we're looking for. So what we want for any newborn screening test is a high sensitivity, so the ability to pick up the illness we're looking for with a low false positive rate, and that's on the bottom. So what we know from the Lancet meta-analysis done on pulse oximetry screening for critical congenital heart disease is that pulse oximetry screening has a good sensitivity, so we're at 76 and a low false positive rate. So it's that red dot um, right there. And it's not perfect. We don't have a perfect screening protocol and haven't been able to develop one, um, as I said, due to the issue of false negatives. Um, but it's very good. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit. I borrowed these slides from Dr. Yor in the UK because they illustrate very nicely uh, the difference of timing makes as to whether you're screening early or screening late. So in the United Kingdom, um, they were looking at 40 months worth of data. Uh, they looked at over 25,000 babies screened, and they were screening early. They were screening around seven hours of life, whereas in the US, we screen at or around 24 hours of age. They had a higher number of false positives well, so this first number, 208, those are all babies that are positive. So that includes false positives and true positives, babies with CHD. Um, so that meant that about 208 babies were being admitted as a result of failed screens. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, they were just having over one admission a week. It wasn't a week. So 208 is the total number of babies during this 40 months that was um, that were being admitted to uh, the higher level care nurseries as a result of a failed screen. Sorry about that. Um, and they were able to identify um, 17 congenital heart defects. However, two were still missed by screening. And what does this mean? So we broke down the false positives into a pie chart. And what we found is that 79% of those fails, so 79% of the 208 babies that required a closer look had a significant clinical condition. Um, so 21% of those were true false positives. So those were healthy newborns that did not have critical congenital heart disease or any of the secondary conditions. Um, and then 71%, so they have a higher number of false positives, but what they're finding is that a large number of those additional false positives are actually um, clinical conditions that you want to detect that are non-CCHD targets. So that's things like sepsis and pneumonia and respiratory illnesses. Um, another thing that's interesting about the UK study that, that they did was that they first, they decided to first eliminate the secondary conditions. So they um, did blood work and they ruled out respiratory and infectious causes 
prior to doing an echo and looking at whether or not the baby had CCHD. And in that way, they were able to cut down on the number of echoes. So instead of um, doing 208, they did 61 echoes. And out of those 61 echoes, about half of them were abnormal echoes. So this, so we've talked about timing in terms of what that means for detection. Um, so timing is important because you're going to have a significantly higher number of false positives um, if you're screening earlier prior to the 24 hours of age. But what you're going to do is you're going to catch more secondary conditions and um, you're going to identify babies earlier. And so I think what was significant in Dr. Yor's study as well was that they had no um, cardiovascular collapse. So babies weren't getting into trouble on the ward because they were screening earlier and identifying those babies earlier. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the pre and post ductal screening aspect. And so what that is is whether or not the um, protocol requires that you screen both the right hand and the foot or whether or not they're just looking at the postductal screening. I know in the U.S., Tennessee looks at just the postductal screening, so they only screen the foot. Um, and then Germany is looking at a recommendation that only screens the foot. And what you do if you screen just looking at the postductal oxygen saturation numbers. There are a few conditions, uh, what, and we learned that from the Grinelli research and Dr. Yor's paper as well. There's a couple babies that are missed, or a couple defects that are missed. So it, uh, if you break that down, it's the equivalent of about seven per 100,000 births if you just rely on looking at the postductal screen. Um, here I have a side-by-side -side of the U.S. protocol and the United Kingdom protocol, with the differences being um, they're screening early, four to eight hours of age. Ours is at or around 24 hours of age. Um, and they also only repeat the screen once after two hours, whereas in the U.S., um, the AAP protocol requires two rescreens if you fall into the retest category um, after one hour each. So those are two differences. So which protocol is best? Um, what we know is that the postductal screen, if you just look at the postductal, uh, you may have a decrease in sensitivity. So pre and postductal testing allows for possible increase in sensitivity, although the meta-analysis didn't show a difference. We just know um, if you're looking at large populations, there may be a few that are missed if you're only looking at that postductal set. Um, so the trade-off between earlier timing is that you're going to have an increase in positive, possibly more false positives, but you're going to detect other important conditions and um, possibly additional cases. Um, So what does that mean? Right now, there is no perfect algorithm. So there's no perfect protocol where we don't have any false positives or any false negatives. Um, but what we do is we try to maximize the sensitivity and minimize the number of false positives. So the US protocol is a hybrid based off the Swedish and United Kingdom data. Um, for larger populations, using both extremities, both the pre and post ductal oxygen saturation appears to be valuable. Um, and earlier testing may offer some benefits, but we have to be willing to accept a slightly higher number of false positives. And that is the exact discussion that's going on right now in Europe. Um, Dr. Martin and I have been privileged enough to go several times. Um, most recently, there was a conference in The Hague and a meeting in Torino. Um, they've been meeting for several years, five or six years, looking at a recommendation for Europe and which protocol to use. Um, this slide just talks about um, the importance of secondary conditions in the developing world. On the left, we have a paper from Malaysia, which lists, I know it's very hard to hear, I apologize, I mean to see, I apologize for the small font, but um, basically they list all different secondary conditions that they're detecting through pulse oximetry screening in addition to critical congenital heart disease. And then these pictures um, on the right are from um, Anna Marie at the Newborn Foundation, and they've done some excellent 
work in Asia around pulse oximetry screening. And I think what we're realizing is that um, while critical congenital heart disease continues to be the primary target of pulse oximetry screening, those secondary conditions um, in the developing world are very important to identify because whereas they may not have ready access to a cardiovascular surgeon or an operating room, um, they are able to treat sepsis and respiratory illnesses with oxygen, antibiotics, and fluids, um, which are much more readily accessible in the developing world. So those, in, um, those continue to be important. So we here, here we have a screening map from 2014. And just to compare that to the current map, which we updated this month, um, we added a new category in dark purple to show which countries have a national recommendation to screen. And it's very exciting. Um, most recently, Argentina, Germany is looking at it, um, and Saudi Arabia, Ireland. Um, there have been many other countries that have added a national recommendation recently. Uh, the other exciting piece, I think, when looking at the global map is how many countries in South America, Africa, and the Far East um, are looking at pilots and screening. So thank you all very much for your attention and I truly and very deeply apologize if I got a little bit jumbled during my slides but we can blame all of that on my little son who is pictured here on the right. I actually, this is my first week back from maternity leave so I do ask for a little bit of forgiveness but it's been such a pleasure and such a privilege to be able to speak with all of you this afternoon on this webinar. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Jackie, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. I think that was a really great overview and presentation <laughs> of just domestically, internationally, what's happening with CCHD, as well as just children's you know, educational efforts for both parents and healthcare providers. So thank you again for presenting. So next we have, and of course, if you have questions, this is just a reminder, there is a question box and a chat box. Please use that, and then we will have a few minutes for questions at the end. So next we have Erin Palmer, who is a 2016 Consumer Task Force member and a parent who will be telling her story. Hi, Jackie. Thanks for having me. Um, do you have my slides up? I do. I am just putting them up now. Great. Can Great, you see them? You. Not quite. Okay. It should be showing now. Okay. Will you be able to click forward for me? Great. My name is Iram Homer, and thank you, Jackie, for inviting me to share our um, story about um, our heart story and our heart journey with our son. Um, we, uh, so I'll just kind of go through the initial part of my presentation and just give a little overview of our family, and I put some pictures up there so people can kind of put a face to a name. Um, but we um, decided that we wanted to expand our family, and you know, I get a lot of questions when they find out Matthew's heart story, my son's heart story, like, oh, you didn't know prenatally, or did you not have ultrasounds, or you didn't have any complications? And so, I always say, nope, we didn't. We were, you know, blissfully unaware of anything. We, um, our story was not one of prenatal diagnosis, so. Um, we just had a healthy, uneventful pregnancy. Um, our ultrasound came back healthy and normal, and um, we had an uncomplicated labor and delivery. Go ahead and look at the next slide. Okay. So here's a picture of our son. He was born in uh, January of 2012. Um, so kind of the timing of things as um, I talk later about uh, why the CCHD screening is important is he was born in January uh, and in the state of Washington, they were not doing a CCHD screening in January of that month, even though it had been recommended um, and added to the RUSP. It wasn't actually being implemented until about May fully of that year. Um, so he passed his APGAR screening at birth. Um, he had a three-day checkup with a pediatrician. Unfortunately, uh, I always kind of wonder if this was a missed opportunity just because we had to see the pediatrician who was available. It wasn't the pediatrician who um, kind of knew our family. So I had feeding concerns, kind of those subtle concerns that um, 
that she was talking about, but the nurses, the pediatrician, they kept, you know, trying to reassure me, oh, you can't compare your children. Every baby, you know, nurses differently. Um, you know, we've checked him, all is well. Next slide, please. So we actually um, made it to day 14. Um, and I still was having my subtle concerns. And I remember waking up that morning saying, wow, I'm really happy that I have my appointment today. And it's going to be with our regular pediatrician um, because I feel like he's panting um, a little bit. You know, his breathing was kind of was different. And he had this lump in his groin. And, and I just remember thinking, oh, wow, I'm really, I'm really glad that I have an appointment. Little did I know, I mean, at the time I was very naive. I knew nothing about, you know, congenital heart defects or um, newborns being critically ill or open heart surgery. So I have to say that was definitely not on my radar, even though I was, you know, having some concerns. I just thought it was, you know, newborn feeding concerns. But we went to our 14-day checkup. Next slide, please. And um, I always am grateful that our pediatrician, when I said instead of trying to reassure me or dismiss my concerns, she said, show me. And I thought that was so wise of her so I could show her exactly um, what I meant uh, by my feeding concerns. And then she was also very concerned at this point. I mean, day 14 is quite late um, for his story. Um, he he was already having retractions and the bump in his groin, which, you know, I had Google doctored, mommy doctored my diagnosis of a, um, of a hernia, which is not a hernia, <laughs> um, was actually his liver because he was, uh, you know, his heart was failing already at that point. So um, it was actually at this moment that she performed the simple pulse oximetry test in the, in the office and she, compa she compared the um, kind of pre-ductal, post-ductal circulation. And at that time, he was already so ill that he um, no longer had uh, pulses in his feet nor in his groins, and he couldn't even uh, register a reading with the pulse oximeter. Um, so then, you know, the medical assistant kept telling me, oh, don't worry, I mean, he's breathing. The machine must be malfunctioning. So they went and got new batteries, got a different pulse oximeter, and you know, kept thinking it was a machine malfunctioning. And then when our doctor came back, um, she put it on the, on his ear to measure the pre and it worked just fine. So uh, we were emergently transported. We emergently transported him to um, Seattle Children's Hospital. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> and that's where um, we had to go through the emergency department, of course, but once cardiology was on board, um, we were admitted to the NICU um, to wait for urgent open heart surgery. Um, he was diagnosed with severe coarctation of aorta, and um, he also has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and so this is just a little finger. You know, I think that sometimes when we look at the, um, you know, data and screening and whatnot, but, I mean, this is just his little hand of an example of how many pokes he had to go through. He was difficult to access at that point because of how sick he was. Um, and we weren't sure at that. I mean, we were completely in shock um, because, you know, we went from our well child two-week checkup to emergent open heart surgery less than 48 hours later. Um, and so we weren't sure... Uh, if he was going to have to have the surgery that night or the next day. Um, next slide, please. Luckily, he was able to um, get a medicine, uh, the PGE medicine, to kind of stabilize him so that he could be the first case on the morning of day 16 um, instead of having to be the third case um, on the day after. Um, so this is... Um, and this is if we thought it couldn't get worse. <laughs> um, I kind of think um, this is where it took another another left in our story. But um, shortly after we we handed him over for surgery, which as a parent is a very emotional and you know not a not an easy thing to do in general. Um, we got a phone call and. At the time, I, I was just trying to be positive as a mom and having just gone through birth, but my husband just kind of looked at me and was like, something really bad has happened. And um, 
because of the timing of it, there hadn't by the time we got the phone call to go back and meet with the doctor, there hadn't been a sufficient amount of time from what they told us of what how long it would take to actually do the surgery. So the surgery, surgeon came out to tell us that Metin had suffered cardiac arrest uh, in the operating room when they had um, opened his opened his chest and or his rib cage, and that they had to resuscitate him and um, crash him onto ECMO uh, life support. Um, and that since the arrest happened before they actually completed the surgical repair, in a sense we had to consent again for them to go back in and complete the surgery to have any chance of saving his life. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so this is our son um, when he came out of surgery on ECMO. Um, you can see how how puffy he is, and the cannulas are on his neck where the um, ECMO machine. ECMO, for those who aren't familiar, um, is a uh, uh, very intensive life support machine that acts as both your heart and your lungs. So his entire circulatory system was outside of his body at that point. Um, and those were, you know, I would say the kind of the darkest days of our journey um, there in the CICU and um, you know we just um, to focus on the positive things we're just so grateful for all the doctors who nurses who had this technology and who were able to manage his life moment to moment the next slide please so there he is uh, about 20 days later um, when he had to learn how to eat again and he had to get strong enough. Once he was um, able to come off of ECMO, he um, fortunately was able to recover and um, miraculously he came home with just an NG tube and one medicine to take four times a day, which in the world of heart, um, heart management is really really easy peasy nothing <laughs> uh, when you know now talking with many more uh, heart families the next slide please so growing up uh, Matine just turned five years old in January he required a balloon angioplasty at five months of age and has uh, been invasive intervention uh, free since then um, still, the future has many unknowns for us. Um, you know, we don't know because of the arrest. You know, in his um, the repair that they ended up doing, we don't know if another surgery is in his future. Um, it's definitely not uh, off the table. Um, but right now, we're just enjoying life uh, and the hope and joy that he brings to us, and how um, grateful we are that he was able to receive um, the life-saving care that he needed. So here's kind of where I um, will take a turn and talk specifically about the story of um, CCHD screening in Washington State. So as of July 26, 2015, uh, CCHD screening is required by law for all newborns in, <clears throat> in Washington. Um, all hospitals in Washington now perform the CCHD screening, and I got this information from one of the pediatric cardiologists that I've been connected with. Um, so Seattle Children's has done surveys and also the Department of Health. Um, Washington also included in their legislation uh, language about the out-of-hospital birth population. Um, so the, the legislation basically says that all the hospitals have to screen before discharge, and for the out-of-hospital birth, the provider has to either perform it or they if they do not perform it, they have to notify the family in writing that the um, baby should be tested um, by their health care provider between 24 and 48 hours of age. Um, what the legislation did not do in the state of Washington is <clears throat> provide any funding for the Department of Health to monitor to make sure that CCHD screening is actually happening um, as required. So that data piece our state is really missing. Um, I met with the State Department of Health um, who oversees CCHD screening and um, she was saying that, that that's their biggest barrier is not having any funding to, um, to put into any data collection for this. So I was encouraged um, by a pediatric cardiologist, uh, Dr. Amy Schultz at Seattle Children's to apply for the Consumer Task Force. Um, we had appeared together in 2014 on a local daytime show called A New Day Northwest to share the importance of pulse oximetry screening and just kind of our story is, the exa is one example of had pulse oximetry screening been implemented at that point, um, you know, would Metin have been caught 
earlier, to receive intervention earlier so that he wouldn't have had to have gotten so sick um, and possibly maybe he wouldn't have arrested then if he hadn't have been so sick. I mean, there are a lot of what ifs in that scenario, but um, I think the earlier that uh, these kiddos can, these babies can get identified, um, as the data showed in the previous presentation, the better the chances of um, are the lower mortality. So I got involved with the Consumer Fat Task Force, encouraged by um, Dr. Amy Schultz, and I really wanted my project to address babies like Methine who are not born in a hospital. Um, and even though it is required by law, there isn't the funding to to kind of look at how implementation is going. So Dr. Amy Schultz and Dr. Meg Vernon had completed a study in 2014 before the CCHD screening came became law in Washington State about how the screening was going in the out-of-hospital birth population in our state. Um, so because that original study was already done um, before, and at that point I believe in the study that they published it was about 60% of midwives surveyed, licensed midwives surveyed, who were either doing um, birth center birth or home birth, were completing the um, CCHD screening, but definitely not the numbers that the, that the hospitals were at the time. So I'm working with them to create a follow-up study to survey the licensed midwives in Washington State now that CCHD screening is required by law. Since it's required by law, I mean, <clears throat> I think the assumption is that all the licensed midwives in the state are either performing the screening, following the law, performing the screening, or referring out. But what we don't know is, um, you know, what were, are there equipment needs specifically? Is there more training or education needs? Um, and have they found, have they caught any babies with CCHD? What are their protocols? So um, we wanted to create a follow-up study to, to kind of tease out those details in the specific population. Next slide, please. And so as, um, as I've gotten involved in uh, being a Consumer Task Force member and really kind of expanding my world and opening the world of advocacy for me, um, I've really become involved uh, trying to grow a heart family community in the state of Washington here, at least in the greater Seattle area for now. Um, I recently founded the Washington State Chapter of the Pediatric Congenital Heart Association. Um, and so we have been working with Seattle Children's Hospital to provide um, kind of a one-hour cookie cough chat, coffee chat time, like as an emotional support for current inpatient families. Um, so they've been really excited about the partnership, and um, we hope to get those started in uh, this April. Um, we also, as an organization, have helped raise money for the national organization to provide care kits um, to current patients and families through surgery. And right now, since we just started out, we're hosting quarterly social events for the Hart families in the area to build friendships and community. I remember um, with um, Mateen feeling very isolated, um, you know, no other mommy group or per parent support group knew what I was going through. Um, even though I had wonderful family and friends who supported me, there wasn't anyone who knew what it was like to have a medically fragile child, to have to be worried about being in isolation during flu season, to just kind of know what that um, that medical trauma in our family looked like. And so I remember feeling very isolated at the time. And I think that um, that one vision we have is for families who are going through this to not feel isolated and that if they do and they want to connect to a group or an organization, that we will be there um, as a community um, to build those friendships and connections. Next slide. Also, professionally as a school counselor, um, I was invited to participate on a panel at the Heart Center Family Education Day. Um, our panel was speaking on the neurodevelopment of heart kids, and I spoke specifically about successful partnerships with school and navigating school resources. Um, and then as a part of that panel, we were invited to take part in the digital education tool project to record a brief video, um, and I spoke specifically on school advocacy that will hopefully be posted to Seattle Children's website in their kind of digital education area um, when it gets up and running, and so then pa parents can um, look at videos to learn about different topics of their choice. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to um, put some pictures out here. Um, I 
these are a lot of the families who are involved in help, helping found the Washington chapter of the Pediatric Congenital Heart Association. And um, I just wanted to give a little shout out to our small but growing steadily community of heart families here in the greater Seattle area and all these wonderful heart kiddos. And last but not least, I just cannot um, fathom doing a webinar or sharing um, that teen story without giving thanks and gratitude to a few key people that um, have been with our, our family on this entire journey. Um, first and foremost, we are always thankful for our wonderful pediatrician, Dr. Holly Ginsberg. Um, I always tell her she was always the first person to save his life, um, to listen to my concerns as a mother, to to not dismiss my concerns and just to be that medical home person whenever we have questions or need anything. Um, we are grateful for Dr. Augustine Rubio. He's Mateen's cardiologist. He has been with us since day one. He was the cardiologist who saw us and diagnosed us in the emergency department. Um, so he's really been with us, you know, from day one through surgery, through ECMO, you know, recovering, now clinic visits, and he's just shown our family such compassion and care and understanding. And um, also Dr. Nicholas Madsen, he's out in Cincinnati now, but um, at the time he was really a key person offering us um, emotional support uh, during Mateen's entire inpatient stay. And as far as my own development as an, a parent advocate, I'm so grateful for all the opportunities that Dr. Amy Schultz has offered me. Um, her support and generosity has truly changed my life um, by opening the doors to this world of advocacy. Um, she, she's patient, she's generous with her time, she is so thoughtful in, in engaging with me and I really appreciate the doors that she's opened for me. And of course, last but not least, we are always forever grateful for our wonderful family and friends who have supported us in so many ways along this heart journey. So I want to thank um, Jackie and Natasha and Baby's First Test for um, giving me the opportunity to share our story. And I'm happy to answer any questions if, if anyone has any specific questions for me from a parent perspective. Great. Thank you so much, Erin. I, I know that everyone probably really appreciate hearing your family's journey with CCHD and listening to your passion and hearing your project. We all know that you're making a huge difference for other parents and families and in the, in the newborn screening community. So I want to thank you for joining today's webinar. Does anyone have any questions? I know that Lisa and Erin are on the line. If you do have any questions, um, there is a question box um, under GoToWebinar that you can submit your question and we can stick around for a little bit. I'm not seeing any questions currently. All right. Well, if there are no... <laughs> Oh, sure. I had a question for <laughs> I'll ask a question. I had a question for Lisa. Um, if any of the screening or how they were taking into account the the home birth population of babies. That's a great question. Was that you, Erin? Or yeah, that was me. Oh. <laughs> so in terms of taking into account, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. You mean tracking oh, or? Yeah, just kind of the data tracking. I mean, I know a lot of your slides were talking about the birthing facilities, and, but I think those mm -hmm. were specific, um, specifically hospital data, I'm guessing. Right, right. Yeah, so, you know, it actually, the way the U.S. is set up, it's very state dependent. So some states do take into account the home birth in terms of tracking um, the screening outcome, but then other states they have almost no data ability to track data and account for whether or not the screening is being done with mid the midwife out of hospital birth population. So there's a huge variety is the best that I can say. You know, some states do it very well and some states have almost no data or actually no data <laughs> when it comes to CCHD screening. So um, I think, you know, there's actually, we focused on it on one of our um, New Steps webinars, and there's actually a whole recording on the out-of-hospital birth 
experience and uh, what's going on with that. And I know that with, in the U.S., you know, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania were two of the speakers on that call talking about the protocols they were using and what they were finding in terms of outcomes for screening. I don't know if that was helpful at all. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. I'll have to check it out, definitely. Thank you. Sure, of course. Great. I'm not seeing any more questions come through, but if you do have questions that come up later, because um, I know it's also over time, you can email me at Jackie at babiesfirsttest.org and I can forward your questions to both Erin and Lisa. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.